welcome to the discussion episode of our Burn Bright series, everyone. We'll be getting to the episode soon, but first, announcements. Woo! All right, uh, first up, one Kickstarter that just recently opened up that we are very excited about is for a game called Thirsty Sword Lesbians. Uh, this is a Powered by the Apocalypse game uh, with swords, magic, and romance. And it's got a boatload of really amazing names behind the game and its stretch goals. So uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. I just saw that Ajay Pandey was doing um, dueling, some diceless dueling rules for it. Yeah, there's um, some, yeah, there's some really, really good names behind it. Yeah, I haven't got it. There. I backed it. I haven't gotten a chance to like look at what it is but i was yep. like uh, i don't know it's got cool people attached to it i'll back it why yeah, not it's, it's very good <laughs> yeah it's it's basically um the title of the the game is ex- everything you need that's to all know you need. i mean honestly that was enough for me so uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and i know uh my design partner amar amarez is doing a uh, superhero um version of the game cool uh, module so awesome uh, that should be really fun that should be. Another Kickstarter uh, you should not miss out on is the Unbound Kickstarter from Grant Howitt and Chris Taylor. They mm-hmm. are reprinting this game that they originally kickstarted in 2016. We are covering it in our next series. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it in before the Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Um, but you you have to take our word for it that this game is fantastic. It is like the best session zero you will ever have, I think is how mm. they describe it. And it yeah. absolutely was. It was one of my favorite recordings that we've done. Um, this game is bananas. It's it's absolutely <laughs> it's worth looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, the promised um, return on Kickstarter investment is supposed to be pretty soon too, because they're basically mm-hmm. using the money to hit print and then you get your game. So yep. Um, I'm very excited for this one. So it's unbound and like everything else, we'll put a link to it in the show notes, but yeah. definitely take a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and speaking of session zeros, um, if you missed out on the session zero to the Chimera campaign uh, that I'm starting up on Twitch, uh, you can actually catch up on the first part of our session zero over on my Twitch page at twitch.chimera.games. Um, and also don't miss out on the first full actual play session of the Cape and Blade stream coming this Friday. Uh, my design partner, Ammer, is running a group through a different Chimera campaign set in a world of flying islands over a mostly water world. This sounds very familiar to next series. What? Uh, <laughs> with uh, fish and crab people. That's a spoiler for our show. Uh, for, I don't think we have any crab people, though. No, not the not the latter, but the, the former part. The flying islands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you'll see. Uh, and it's just amazing all around. So uh, check out what they came up with and uh, hear a really cool uh, stream at capeandblade.chimera.games. That should be everything for the announcements part of this episode. Mm-hmm. You can stick around at the end of the episode for our call to action and, of course, outtakes. But first, let's get on with the show. Enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time, we created characters for Burn Bright. This episode, we'll be discussing the character creation process. We are thrilled to welcome back Celeste Konowich and Eugenio Vargas. Do you want to reintroduce yourselves for everyone at home? Tell us a little bit about the character you made last time. Yeah, sure. Um, so, hi everyone again. Uh, my name is Eugenio. You might know me as DM Jazzy Hands. Uh, primarily, I am the dungeon master and producer of an actual play D and D podcast called The Last Refuge. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at DM Jazzy Hands. The show at, at DND Last Refuge, uh, and. I do lots of other things that I'm not going to list right now. You should check out my website, (laughs) eugeniovargas.com. I'm sure there'll be a link in the episode notes because I'm not going to tell you how to spell it right now. (laughs) Uh, Cool. You're driving. Uh, You don't have a pen anyway. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, this is the thing, right? Like, I mean, it would be very flattering if you pulled over and fought and wrote this down right now. But I, it's, that seems excessive. Mm-hmm. Uh, my <laughs> character that I created last week uh, is a peacecraft. Uh, the peacecraft are a well, they're they're giant robots. Uh, <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it, they were created. Uh, as weapons, essentially, uh, they attained uh, sort of independent sentience and uh, their makers, the civilization that created the Peacecraft was destroyed in the wars that the Peacecraft are created for. Uh, so the Peacecraft have now, as a species, dedicated themselves to never participating in war again. Uh, so that is a little bit about the Peacecraft. Mine's name is Alienware 17 uh, cause, <laughs> cause it is, uh, Peacecraft will often be named, uh, with a name and then a number after it because Peacecraft are essentially immortal, except in mm-hmm. specific circumstances when their physical body dies, their, uh, their men, their brain gets uploaded to a server and can be redownloaded into a new body. So is this the 17th incarnation of Alienware? Yeah, exactly. This one's been around. Uh, this one's been around for 16 previous incarnations and many more in the future, we hope. Um, just super briefly, a little bit more about him, about, let's see, uh, we'll just talk about his main goal in life, his story path, because we're going to talk about advancement later. Uh, basically, he wants to figure out how to upgrade himself to a higher form of life. And we talked a little bit last week, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, about how he is in particular considering ways to integrate uh, uh, biological components into his body. Very cool. Uh, and hey, my name is Celeste Conowich. I am a freelance uh, tabletop role-playing game designer uh, out there in the world. I'm also the producer for uh, Venture Maidens, an actual play D&D podcast, and the game master for the uh, Roll20 First Look Burning Daylight uh, Burn Bright game. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. Uh, <laughs> I, I love Burn Bright, and I'm excited to talk about it, uh, including the character that I made last time, uh, which is named Frongo. And uh, Frongo <laughs> is an Olran, which is a species of uh, crystalline humanoids. So basically their bodies are entirely formed of crystal, and as they age, um, they become uh, harder and more compact uh, until the point when they actually can't move anymore. Uh, So the Ulran as a species are uh, very militaristic uh, in their culture. So they are raised uh, with, you know, a a high value put on efficiency and actually working uh, as part of the Ulran military is is required. Um, So my Ulran in particular, I took a bunch of special abilities uh, that have to do with like a crystalline glow feature. So I have an inner glow that I can like shine out with bright crystal light and then I have also the strong glow which is the bigger version of that where I can actually like blind people or hurt people with my radiance Uh, (laughs) and uh, since I am super into radiant and you know making beautiful things since I am a beautiful crystal being I took the story path uh, create masterpiece because I think uh, Frongo's mission in life is to create the most beautiful uh, sword uh, in in existence, so mm-hmm. that is their entire uh, quest. So uh, that's me, and that's Frongo. <laughs> awesome, uh, Amelia. Why don't you tell us about your character? Sure. Um, I made a glean named Hullabaloo. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I so for my story path, I picked um, Bond. Really. Hullabaloo just wants to make friends. Um, That's kind of their whole thing. And I do remember last time now buying a lot of flashlights for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, very nice. Because I didn't know what to spend all my, spend all my money on. You just bribe people um, with flashlights to be your friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, look, <laughs> I, have this, I have this flashlight. Please, please come be friends with me. Um, no, and I, a lot of my special abilities revolve around healing, Um. Oh, also, I can um, breathe air and swim in water and do all of those fun things, too. Yeah. And I'm immune to toxins, apparently. Basically an alien jellyfish with a crystal in your head or something like that. I think so. It's very adorable. Uh, If you see the artwork, it's it's quite adorable. 
And I definitely remember having more ideas about this character last time, but everyone listening, it has been a while since we recorded (laughs) the first part of our series. So if there are things that came up before and you're like, why didn't that come up again? It's because we forgot. Yep. (laughs) I immediately started doing like I do on my show and pretending that it's been a week exactly since the last time we met. (laughs) Awfully forgetful, even for a week. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Ryan, what about you? All right. uh, So I created an Eno of the uh, ore variety, uh, which means that I am a cat person, alien type uh, being with uh, ties to the scientific community. Um, And let me see if I can get her name right. Uh, Tisela Morgana Mishra Helio Aria Tiana Roswin Kell. Otherwise, uh, you can call her (laughs) Tiana Roswin. That's magical. Yes. <laughs> that is so many names, Ryan. <laughs> I know. It only took me a month and a half to get that name uh, crafted. So yeah, I think it was worth uh, the wait. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's like uh, how long yeah. it takes me to come up with a regular name. Uh, the irony of all of that is uh, my story path is double life. So that means I have to make up another name <laughs> for myself. <laughs> 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 but not as part of character creation, because the new you is the first part of the path, and that is crafting another uh, character uh, that you want to become effectively. Um, and I kind of helped that along with uh, some equipment that I bought. I bought one of those uh, face-changing disguise badges, yeah. Uh, yeah, where cool. it basically you can think of what you want to look like, and this... Uh, I don't know, through hollow magic, I guess, uh, makes you look that way. Uh, and that's kind of cool. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to uh, escape from my former life. I think it was because uh, I was on the outs with the scientific community uh, of the Eno uh, because of my uh, fringe uh, uh, theories about mm-hmm. the uh, the burn that is trying to consume the entire galaxy. Yeah, you never stop to ask if you should I know. with your science. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and actually, I I have theories uh, since last time we recorded, but I'll keep those to myself for now uh-huh. uh, until maybe the fanfic portion. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's Tiana Roswin. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive into a segment we call D twenty for your thoughts. D twenty for your thoughts. All right. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. But first, we'd like to get to know our guests a bit better. So we are going to get the cliche question out of the way. Can you tell us how you got into RPGs in the first place? Ooh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Um, So I got into RPGs about 15 years ago. Um, So when I was growing up, uh, my dad in college played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm. Uh, And then, you know, later in life, when uh, he moved out, uh, there there came a point where my mom was like, oh, I'm going to get rid of all your dad's like old junk. And like, do you want any of it? You like go through the boxes. Otherwise, I'm just going to throw it away. So I was like, okay. Uh, So I, I went through the boxes and I found one that had, you know, a permanent marker written on the side of this brown cord cardboard box, D and D. And I was like, what is happening? Uh, So I opened up the box (laughs) and that box was full of books and notes about dragons and fantasy worlds and monsters and had a bunch of like also my my dad's like handwritten campaign notes uh, from when he ran games and like his his character sheets. And so it was just a ton of treasures that had been jammed in this box. And uh, I was definitely hooked um, right then and there. I was like, what? Like this is it's not just a book. It's a game you can play with people. (laughs) What is going on? Uh, So so I read those books so much uh, religiously, and it was probably years later that I got to, oh gosh, so no, I've been, I guess, into RPGs for longer than 15 years, not to date myself. I've been playing for about 15 <laughs> years. Uh, and at that point, you know, eventually... 
somewhere in in middle school, I think I was able to like get a group together for the first time and actually start running games. Um, and then, you know, some some years ago when like podcasting and RPGs became a big thing, that was when I started Venture Maidens and mm-hmm. I learned fifth edition D&D to actually start Venture Maidens because I had been playing older editions because I had no idea there was such a cool community of people um, <laughs> on the Internet who <laughs> loved games. Uh, so what I started the podcast i was like wow oh my gosh there's there's so many cool people out here and uh-huh. there are so many games out here so really over the last five years um i have had the privilege of learning so many other games uh, on top of you know that the gateway game dungeons and dragons uh and just getting to know rpgs and in the last year uh, I've actually started writing them. So I am now a full-time freelance writer uh, for RPGs. So I guess that's a story like 20 years in the making of how <laughs> how I um, am here uh, in, in desperately in love with role-playing games. I, I love how your introduction began with an actual like... Uh, facsimile of an adventurer's oh, yes. treasure find. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That we are so box in, in the garage. And then, I boom. see you open it up in the, the gold the glow, glow. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> da, 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 da. I love that you actually got to get that, though, because I like was already making this podcast and playing games and all that kind of stuff, and I was sitting on the floor in the basement, like flipping through one of my RPG books or something. And my mom goes to my dad, (laughs) look at those nerds. Remember, you used to do that. And And I went like, dad, what? What? (laughs) What? And he's like, yeah, in high school. I was like, I had to figure this out all on my own. Oh, no. There's all these years I could have been playing games. You never (laughs) told me. (laughs) Oh, yes. Eugenio, how about yourself? Nothing, nothing quite so storied and, and epic. <laughs> oh uh, boy! <laughs> uh, mine is is a much uh, a much more recent journey. Uh, I grew up mostly with video games, and I loved RPG video games. Uh, but sort of, honestly, uh, I mean, I guess I had heard of Dungeons and Dragons, but couldn't have told you really what much about it uh, for a long time. And a few months before fifth edition came out. So that would be like six and a half years ago now or so. Um, I was at home run night with one of my roommates uh, and we'd both had a few drinks and he turned to me and he said, there's something I have to tell you. (gasps) And I can tell you that I did not anticipate what he was going to tell me, but I anticipated (laughs) just about every other possible option. Uh, So he turns to me and I like heart racing a million miles an hour. And he goes, I have always really wanted to play D and D. And I went, huh? Oh yeah. Cool dude. Me me too. Uh, And the rest is sort of, I guess, as they say, history. I I had some friends um, in a choir that I was the associate conductor for at the time uh, who I knew played a regular weekly game. So I asked uh, I asked one of them if they would mind if if my roommate and I came and joined them. Uh, And this group is still together in in some permutation and has been for almost 15 years now. So they're they're pretty careful about their group. Uh, (laughs) So we had to go and like observe and and uh, for lack of a better term, audition to play with this group who was still playing 3.5 at the time. Uh, But fortunately, they embraced us with open arms Uh, and we started playing there. The 5e starter set came out not too long after that, and the core books started coming out. Uh, And I had one of them with me at uh, a rehearsal for a show that I was subbing in uh, on the keyboard for. My friend was the director. She spotted the book and said, oh, my God, is that (laughs) D&D? And I said, yes. And so she then told me about this plan that she had always had to get a group of her girlfriends together to play D&D. But they, you know, they'd never gotten it actually to happen because no one would run the game. And and she said, will you run it for us? And I said, well, I'm not one of your girlfriends, but but if that's OK, then, yes, I will do that. <laughs> uh, and so we started running Lost Mind of Fandel for a group of uh, I guess there was six of us, five players and me. And uh, we played every week for years and years. That group is now scattered to the four corners uh, of the country, although several of them are now on my podcast. Uh, So we are still (laughs) playing together all these years later. Uh, So, yeah, that's sort of how it all started for me uh, as a as a bit of a drunken accident. (laughs) 
there are worse drunken accidents to have. Yes, there are. Truly. I was ready for as any far of those. <laughs> <laughs> I killed a man. What? No, I just want to play oh, D&D. God. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I guess that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us your process for picking and creating characters in any game when you sit down to play? Oh, um, I think it sort of depends on... There are a lot of factors that really change it up for me. Um, mm-hmm. Is it uh, is it going to be one to three sessions? Is it going to be short? Is it going to be a longer form campaign? Do I know the people that I'm playing with or the GM? Um, all of that sort of really informs where I go. You know, if it's something shorter, if it's people that I'm comfortable with, then I'm going to find something sort of goofy and outlandish to, to put together. Something, you know, very against typical type. Uh, mm-hmm. If it's going to be something longer or something where I don't know some of the players as well or the GM as well, uh, you know, there's some old standby tropes that I am particularly comfortable with. Uh, you know, I love uh, a rogue or anything sort of around that uh, that is sort of snarky and sarcastic and sassy. Uh, like that's an easy trope for me to build off of if uh, I'm not so comfortable with the people that I'm playing with yet, if I don't know them as well. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I don't know. That's I, I'd never really thought about it because it is so different with every, you know, circumstance for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, I'm I'm absolutely that player who demands that everybody else picks their character first before <laughs> I pick my uh, character, um, because it's it, I always love to see what everybody else has made. And then I like to cover a base that hasn't been covered mm-hmm. um, just to, you know, because if if we have a bunch of magic slingers in the party, I don't want to also be slinging magic. I want to be special and different. So I'll pick a fighter, <laughs> uh, you know, or if like if we're playing Burn Bright, if everybody picks a bug person, I definitely <laughs> don't want to do that. So I <laughs> yeah. go That's the other why way. You don't want to pick a bug person. <laughs> Ugh, I'll go the other way and pick a robot, you know. You know, um, I just I really love uh, balancing parties with with different uh, points of view um, or experience. You know, it's the same thing if you're playing something like Call of Cthulhu where you're all professions. You know, if if everybody is picking, you know, blue collar jobs, I'm going to go ahead and be like, you know, the up in the clouds, like pre-med student or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always want to to bring something else uh, to the party because I love playing that opposition. So that takes me in some interesting directions when I play games because sometimes I will just pick the thing that is most different. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, exploring what that is, uh, you know, it's a good way to figure out what your preferences are or not, just always picking uh, the total opposite of things. But that's usually how I go about uh, picking my characters. I, I don't have more of a, a schooled method uh, for doing so <laughs> other than just being an upstart. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do we think character creation in uh, Burn Bright stacks up to other systems that we've played? How would you compare that? Well, the fact that, uh, you know, character creation was done with an eye to doing it on roll 20. Uh, mm-hmm. it's such a smooth process. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with just the way that that character mancer is formatted, you have all of the details about each options in a little panel to the right. You're clicking through in a, in an order that I think generally makes a, a good bit of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and even if and when, uh, you know, expanded character options become available, I don't see the character creation process becoming super unwieldy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there aren't uh, the the species. There are eight options and they're all, you know, pretty, pretty well delineated. Uh the system background, uh, you know, those options are, are fairly clear and you could certainly make different combinations, but the mm-hmm. the basic stats of each of those is fairly clear. The only thing that, you know, has a lot to click through really are the story paths, although you can rely on their titles to at least give you an idea of flavor without having to really reading, without mm-hmm. having to really read through each step of it and the equipment. Um, but I, I think it's really pretty well streamlined. Uh, yeah. Yeah, what I really found interesting about Burn Bright characters versus other systems characters is they've really like kind of done away with the idea of like, 
you know, race versus class or species versus class. Cause usually when I pick a character, I always think class first. I'm like, what is my mm-hmm. job going to be? I'm going to be, I'm going to be a wizard. I'm going to be sneaky. I'm going to, you know, be, be a doctor. Like that's usually how I think about things. So in this game, there is no like job or profession, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's just right. your species that dictates what all of your abilities are. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you can have, you know, two gleans in the party, but they can be wildly different gleans you know, based on what evolutionary special abilities they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I found that really interesting to to really switch my perspective on what what a character would be and how they would interact in the world, you know, because the identity of my species is comes first in Burn mm-hmm. Bright uh, as opposed to the identity of my job or my class. Um, so I found that really, really interesting. And honestly, I was worried about not enjoying that uh, when I started playing Burn Bright, but I I fell in love with it very quickly. And honestly, the fact that there are, um, you know, only these eight species or these eight sapients, you know, in Olaxis makes like every NPC in the game feel more relatable somehow because, mm-hmm. you know, people are all sort of from the same places or the same lineages, you know, um, mm-hmm. It's it's sort of hard to explain, but it just makes everything feel more connected and like you all are make more sense as a group together because you're just kind of people like in the world doing yeah. things instead mm-hmm. of like a, a person who's trained in the assassin arts or whatever. <laughs> um, so that's that was the big thing uh, for yeah. Burn Bright character creation for me that really set it apart from a lot of other systems I've played. Yeah, it's really interesting because going through the process, it's easy to to use the uh, the the tool that they have on roll twenty to to just say, okay, I want this option, um, okay, and that gives me this, okay, and then go to the next thing, get this option, and so on and so on. Um, but all that lore that's like literally right there, uh, either if you click on the information button right next to the option, or you click on the option itself, and boom, there's some information for you. Uh, there's a lot of really good lore mm-hmm. uh, for pretty much everything uh, that you can choose in this game, which is fantastic. And and reading through all of that, uh, especially seeing all of the like, uh, you you can definitely see there's like an eye for uh, alien biology oh, yeah. uh, in a lot of the background lore, which is really interesting. Um, mm-hmm. It it really preps you for. And uh, an understanding of what this galaxy is kind of like, uh, especially diving into a little bit of what the systems are all about for that lore or uh, or the the overarching uh, galactic lore that you can get to before you even go into character creation. If you want, um, there's there's just a lot of really interesting uh, stuff there to to kind of fit yourself into as a character. Yeah, but I also like on the the flip side of that, it never feels like you have to master lore yes. to choose character options. Yeah, so they exactly. really they really got an elegant balance when mm-hmm. designing this game to for the people who want to read more and know more and look for a place in the lore, or the people who don't want to do any of that but want to pick cool things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's really appeals to both types of players. Yeah, well, absolutely. and it's easy because like the book info is like book quote unquote um is all linked in the character building part Mm. so you get to a part where you're like i don't know what this thing is or what it does and you click it and it'll open that section of the book for you so you can Mm -hmm. read it there so like looking at you fantasy flight with your terrible indexes um (laughs) it's so much easier (laughs) this way like it makes it really simple and quick and there's not there are times where I'm building a character in a game and it's like, well, I don't know what that thing does. So rather than look it up, I'm just not going to pick that option Mm -hmm. because it Mm -hmm. would take too much time to go find that thing. And, you know, this eliminates a lot of that too. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I had to uh, recreate my character because for some reason I had a a glitch on my, my old character. Um, And it was super easy to just be like, okay, um, I kind of remember what I did. Oh, yeah. No, okay. I remember this and this and this and this. And then I was done. Like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a fully fleshed out character. And it was it was pretty easy to to go through that. So once you're familiar with the system, um, it's, it, it's really easy to just go in and say, okay, I want these skills to be high. I want these skills to be low. And 
here's a good balance. And now I know what all these numbers and everything mean. And it, it just makes sense. Yeah. How do you feel like the process of character creation reinforces the feel of the game? Uh, I think we I think some of what Celeste already said uh, sort of talks about this and it revolves around, you know, the lack of classes, the people doing heroic things as opposed to, you know, a rogue, a wizard, a fighter and a and a cleric doing heroic things. There's not a ton of crunch in the character creation, right? Even when you're picking mm-hmm. the die sizes for your skills, the descriptions of each skill are, are fairly straightforward and short, a sentence, maybe two sentences. Uh, and then you pick your die sizes. And that, I think, really enforces this idea of, you know, people who do heroic things. The the fact that you can mix and match skills and get creative and use whatever you want uh, in all kinds of situations, you know, is really reinforced when you look at those lists and you say, well, I've, I've got a D12 and two D10s and three D8s and 66s to assign. I don't know. I don't have a a real sense of, you know, what this person's heroic class would be, but I could start thinking about who they are as a person if their, you know, uh, knowledge and engineering is really high, but their empathy is really low, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. It shifts it to really think about character narrative uh, because ultimately when you're actually playing the game, you're going to have dice of all sizes. You're going to want to use dice of all sizes. So ultimately... To, to really like power game your stats in character creation is a kind of difficult and be super pointless, <laughs> if I may say. <laughs> um, and I, and I think the, the, the process makes that makes that pretty clear. You know, it doesn't put more emphasis on picking your stat dice than it does on picking your background system or your equipment or your story path. You know, it's mm-hmm. all just sort of there as part of this narrative. Yeah, uh, and something I, I, I've i had the privilege of getting to play with a, a lot of different groups for Burton Bright. So it's always really interesting to see how people interact with this new game and what they what kind of journeys they go through as players. And I think this game in in the macro theme and in actual play is a game about discovery because, you know, in, in this universe, right, that is this galaxy that is collapsing. The question is, what do you do? How, what do you do in this moment? What are you doing with the time you have? Mm. And that really comes through in, in play because, you know, you don't have so many things built out for you. You don't have this like bullet point like oh I can do these three things and that's what makes me good at my character uh, you know it's mm-hmm. it's always discovering w- how you would use the skills you have um, what are your go to tricks you know developing in combat what does it look like being a social character in combat like you you absolutely have the freedom to start at zero and then kind of explore what your character does in each and every moment and how you use all the different tools that have been provided to you by the game. Uh, So usually, you know, session one or two, players are a little bit confused by the amount of freedom they have. uh, But, you know, you watch them and they try something and immediately this, like, light goes off and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, I can use a turn to set up an advantage awesome and then you know they then they do it again and then it builds and it becomes this awesome spiral of them you know learning how their character works both uh, mechanically and in this world and so characters get defined uh, really well because they're given the space in character creation uh, to grow and to change I mean the story path mechanic is literally that like Mm -hmm. you are exploring a facet Mm -hmm. of yourself and advancing it uh, and every part of this game and the character creation feels uh, all, all about that that kind of advancement about how do you do what you do yeah, I, I remember listening to Autonomic, uh, which uses the same system uh, as Burn Bright. Um, and uh, you could hear after a couple of episodes when they first start doing advantages, they're like, wait, we, we can we can spend our turns doing that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. effectively. And then uh, and then it's like, OK, yeah, let's let's do that because it seems to help. Uh, and and actually, when I was uh, making my character, I, one of my uh, abilities that I chose was based on uh, if we have four advantages banked, 
during the current scene. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see uh, myself or other characters on the team creating advantages to to just activate these abilities, which will make things m much more interesting throughout the whole session, which is kind of oh. cool. So we like to uh, look at the character sheets, too, before we, we actually even dive into character creation at times um, and discuss kind of the intention behind the sheets design um, and what sort of story that it tells. Um, since this game is experienced entirely through Roll20, uh, what thoughts do you have about these character sheets since they are completely digital uh, and not at all designed with pen and paper in mind? Sure. So something um, I have encountered, I do think these sheets, because um, they are designed to be simple and, you know, instead of a lot of words explaining what's going on, there's a lot of symbols on this game. So like to do conditions, you have, it's a heart with a plus in it, you know, nowhere does it say like this is a minor condition um, on the actual sheet. Uh, so I do think that is an adjustment for people who are used to character sheets with a lot of information. Um, mm. I know when running mm -hmm. games, I've had to explain specifically what those symbols mean, and it does take people a little while to get it. Mm -hmm. um, so it is very symbol-oriented and, like, geometry, which I think actually works for uh, really well for this kind of this new generation we're seeing mm -hmm. of uh, tabletop role players where, cause you know, if I was walking into this and I had never played a game before, I, I think it would be very intuitive to like press a big heart and I get something good with a plus in it and, mm -hmm. you know, pick, pick the right. little <laughs> negative heart. And I think I get something <laughs> bad. Um, but I, I do think it is, you know, it's challenging players who have played a lot of other games to kind of retrain their brains um, to use this interface. So I can definitely see that being a challenge um, for players used to other systems, but um, it's, a, it's a bold design choice. Uh, and I, I think it works well uh, for this game in particular. Yeah, I agree with all that. I, the thing for me that, that has come up a couple of times as someone who is used to pen and paper is, uh, is that there isn't an obvious place on the character sheet for notes. You know, you think about mm -hmm. a, a pen and mm -hmm. paper character sheet and you're just scribbling all over it everywhere. You know, you're turning it over to the back and you're writing down important NPC names and things like that. There are there are places uh, that you can do that on here, but they're not on sort of that that central character sheet tab that you're probably going to have up most of the time, mm -hmm. um, which is which is interesting uh, because this is such a narrative and story focused. I mean, we've talked ad nauseum at this point about, you know, how much it's about discovery and creating stories and not uh, sort of feeling beholden to character tropes and classes like in other games. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it feels like a free write space uh, might be might be a good thing for the sheet. But on the other hand, I think Celeste is absolutely right. I think it's about just getting used to the system, you know, there isn't an easy way to have a scribble pad on a digital character sheet, you know, unless you have a tablet and a stylus and the capability to do that. There's not an easy, universally accessible way to do that. And so actually, I think the way that a lot of the rest of the character sheet is laid out I think sort of takes care of some of that for you. And it, and it is just a bit of a learning curve for us, mm -hmm. you know, for those of us who are used to, to having pen and paper sheets, it hasn't adversely affected our, our game of it. I have noted it on a couple of occasions, but found solutions pretty simply and it, it hasn't been a, a problem. Um, so and yeah, I think I that's mean, a I, thing like playing online generally, like regardless of rule 20 or regardless of burn bright, like that's just a thing that you kind of have to get mm -hmm. used to. Like you can still print out a physical sheet and stuff, but like making notes and, you know, like when you're using rule 20 for any kind of game, I think is Definitely. just like, it's a little bit of a learning curve. Like I keep a notebook and, mm -hmm. you know, put my notes in there and then that solves that. Like, just, yeah. Just get a yeah. character journal. It'll be yeah. fine. I, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. And, and I, you know, I sort of, I only pointed out for, for burn bright in particular, because, you know, we're talking about designing this character sheet from the ground up for this system. Right. And rather than try to design and develop some way to have a scratch pad on the character sheet, they just said, you know, we're going to teach our players from go from jump that 
this is the important information that we've got for you. And, you know, just getting used to, to finding your own solutions mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I will say I was um, I was pretty scared when Roll20 came to me and was like, hey, do you want to run this game? And I was like, yes. And they're like, it's all exclusively on Roll20. So you're going to have to learn it and show it off. And I was like, oh, God, <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. that was that was the scariest part of the process, mm-hmm. because I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who considers myself I with work. I am proficient at mm-hmm. best with technology, but it always takes work. Uh, <laughs> so that was definitely the scariest part of learning this game and running it, especially with all these eyes on me. Um, so I, I will say at first it was absolutely a challenge because I'm fighting, you know, all the instincts in my body where I have like a paper notebook where I keep all of my campaign notes forever and then like running the system. And it was like hard for the first couple episodes because those two things were fighting. But the more I run this game, um, you know, and, and I've had to learn like, oh, that you don't have the scratch pad space or like, where do you put things? Mm-hmm. Now I find myself almost never using my paper notebook I did at the start because now I can create files where I save all of my tokens mm-hmm. and I've found places where I can make my campaign notes and like I can do my journal sections that I can quick reference. Um, so it, it certainly is a training process um, and it makes your brain work different, uh, but it does start working, you know, mm-hmm. when you invest the time in it. Absolutely. I like to, because there are all of those visual cues on the sheet that it's, it's kind of easy to tell how to play right from mm. the sheet mm. um, because like, it's like, Oh, I have a D4 in computers. There's computers. There's a little like triangle with a four in it next to it. And it's like, okay, I can tell exactly how good I am as opposed to being like, okay, what die do I roll? And then yeah, what I don't modifier know, what do, do I, I add, add to it? And, this, and, then, hey, you know, yeah. and then it's like, because it's an interactive character sheet too. Like I can click the things and it will do it for mm-hmm. me. Um, but it is really easy to visually see, like, okay, clearly I am better at presence. I have a bigger die. Like, you know, it, it it becomes really easy to see what things are used for and how to use them. And I just clicked on one of the dice for the skills, and it pops up with a complexity mm-hmm. rating. Uh, You can type in a condition bonus, and it gives you a total as well or whatever. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then you just roll, and then it pops up in the chat and tells you what happened and if you pass. And that's, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So my first first attempt at a skill roll was to deceive uh, at a four complexity, and I just passed it. You're very good at deceiving. That's a a hard complexity. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it's it's really cool because yeah, it, since it's all online, you don't have to pick up actual dice. You just click a couple buttons and there's your skill roll. And y- you can kind of even forget about some of those rules cuz it does it all for you. Mm-hmm. Um so it's mm-hmm. it's really interesting how this is all set up here. Yeah, it's um it's pretty bonkers being a GM for this game cuz you never roll any dice. Oh yeah. Not a single one. I I like Uh, games like that. I know Numenera, the Cypher system has that. Uh, PBTA is very notorious for that. Yeah. Um, And and Burn Bright as well. I I love putting all of that onto the player's (laughs) hands. uh, There are some... But what I do like are there are some random table macros. Um, so if you want to use those, uh, and you don't have to, uh, you are welcome to use those to create random chaos as a GM. So I, I always get really excited when I get to roll on my uh, my, my chaos <laughs> random <fun>. tables. <laughs> so Eugenia fun. knows too well. So much fun. <laughs> so fun for everyone. Oh no, your ship has a hole. You're getting sucked oh, into God. space. Oh, oh, no. No. oh no. Who could have seen that coming? <laughs> what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in the system? And then what do you think is a thing that it does best? Um, I think, and this is something that's just going to improve as more people play and as Roll20 continues to get feedback. But Uh, because there is no, I mean, I suppose you could print out one of these sheets and make one, but there isn't a, a analog backup system that comes with this. 
Uh, Mm -hmm. And so there are a few just tech things that we discover that are do odd things. You know, I somehow during one of our episodes turned my character sheet into that of a blip, a small uh, teleporty (laughs) dog creature, (laughs) Creature? fox creature. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) You know, there are a few things when you're when you're creating your character that, uh, you know, don't fully give you the information that you could find in the rule book or that maybe are uh, several clicks away. Uh, And I think all of that stuff is just, you know, it's going to get better as more people are exposed to the system. Roll20 Mm -hmm. so far has been pretty receptive when we have pointed out particularly, uh, uh, you know, difficult glitches that we've found. Um, uh, I do know since we've recorded, they've they've updated a version two uh, to everything. So they fixed a ton of bugs and stuff just from just from, you know, a month ago when we recorded. Yeah, Yeah. I remember there was like a slight thing with figuring out like where points were coming from when we were putting dice Mm. into things or something like that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I would actually, knowing now that there's a a version two, I'd be interested to to click through it again. It it did feel simpler when I was recreating my character too. Oh, maybe they did. For assigning those dice, so. Good, good. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, just... Having to rely on fickle, fickle technology uh, is perhaps a, a, a flaw of creation. Um, and but that also does make it easier to fix those things. Unlike well, a printed book when you send it out and it's like, well, <laughs> that's it. You get what you get. I guess like here's our online 50 pages of errata that we're putting out every month. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, that's that's it was actually exactly what I was going to say. A perfect a perfect segue is that, you know, the things that that might be problematic now are so easy to fix. Um mm. Uh, You know, another sort of thing that we've already talked about is, you know, once you've created the character is that the dice are all there and it does all of that for you. That's awesome. There are no math hurdles to get over. There are no remembering what die to use to get over. That's all great. I don't know. Maybe sometimes I kind of miss playing with my math rocks. Not (laughs) me personally, not actually all that much. I do love (laughs) dice, but like not enough to be sad about it. But like, eh, you know, as we move to this to this uh to this digital sort of world of of tabletop role playing, you know, they're just things that we sort of have to get used to changing. And there are definitely, definitely benefits to all of them. Speaking of of updating with errata, I'll never forget. I was reading through we got sent a, a PDF of of the book before we all started to play. And I was reading through and I don't remember what species it was, but in the list of uh, suggested names for the species, I saw that one of the names happened to be a not terrible, but like kind of a rude word in another language <laughs> that I happened to speak. Uh, and so I, you know, I messaged the Roll20 team and they were like, oh my God, we're so sorry. I was like, you have to apologize to me. I thought it was hilarious. I just like, I'd like to know. Uh, and so like that is a tiny little errata thing that just like you said, Amelia, like would require a, a PDF document to get out. And then you, now they just changed it. Yeah. Right. That's cool. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, and then next time you log in, it's it's fixed. You don't have to re-download a PDF or anything like that. It's just right. it's just all right there. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you do get. I used to be one of those people that was like, oh, I need physical dice, and like because I always played at a table, and mm-hmm. you know, like I I do have like that tactile thing. Like I I like dice. Um, I've gotten used to not doing them, and like it's it turns everyone it's. It's pretty okay. Like it's gonna be okay. It, mm-hmm. You get used to it. Yeah, and, and if if you're on roll twenty with that, you can have the the quote unquote virtual dice uh, that roll all across the table, uh, which I always found extremely satisfying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have some groups. I I have a D and D group. We're playing through a game, a D and D game on roll twenty, and we use roll twenty for everything, but we just roll real dice too. And some of us mm-hmm. roll in there and some, you know, it's just uh, more options. Um, what's great, you know, about digital dice is it really helps uh, with accessibility for mm-hmm. some folks. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, folks who who might not be able to see as well, digital dice is really great. They can, you know, incorporate readers. And um, so it's just really nice, honestly, to have all the options sort of at, at your disposal. And you never drop virtual dice on the floor. Yes, you never, you never step on the floor. You never have to like, <laughs> crawl under your desk to find them. Uh, you never step um, on them, which is You great. always have great. the right this dice great because yeah. occasionally you're like, I have this set, and uh, for some reason there's only six of them because my children were playing with them. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I think just for me, one of the, I, I don't know if it's a flaw necessarily, but I think something I would like to see or maybe consider uh, for, for story paths, uh, which is sort of the level advancement mm. mechanic, which I know we're going to talk about in a little bit. I feel like that is one of the most unique parts of this game, mm -hmm. and it, it might behoove the system to not force people to pick a story path until they delve into an adventure in mm -hmm. particular. So not making mm -hmm. the story path part of character creation, but rather doing it at the top of like a session zero of an adventure. Because mm -hmm. I feel like there are some story paths that really steer what you're going to be doing and some that work with adventures and some that work totally don't work with adventures. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And I, I can see that that's probably a lot of pressure for somebody to decide with a character they're still kind of meeting, like mm -hmm. what their goal is going to be. Um, so I, I think that is probably the, the, the part that's not quite working yet for me. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that can also be fixed too. like, it, you know, you can just redo your story path if you want, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's, I think, probably the the little hitch for me in character creation. Um, but otherwise, I, I super enjoy the options and getting to see, you know, all the lore I want or all the lore I don't want during mm -hmm. the character yeah. creation mm -hmm. process is my favorite part. Yeah, <laughs> for absolutely. Me. Yeah. Yeah. As the person who picked a story path that doesn't really work with our adventure, uh, <laughs> I, I plus one that all the way. I will also say, uh, since we're since we're talking about story paths a little bit, uh, the speaking of technological uh, hiccups, uh, ticking off steps of your story path is super intuitive. Choosing the upgrades, the way that the character mancer then forces you into a screen where you can no longer see your stats, your die sizes, and then mm. you have to choose what you want to upgrade. There's there's a fix in there that I am, you know, I'm not a coder, Better so I don't know what mine. it is. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Uh, if this were pen and paper, I could maybe figure something out, right? But uh, but there is there is a fix there that will make that a little that process that advancement process. I feel like we're doing a segue now, but anyway, uh, that advancement process a little bit more elegant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. So. I want to get into uh, the group's cohesion portion of the show, a.k.a. the fan fiction portion. Uh, what are our fine, fine alien folks uh, up to? Uh, what what do we do? Ryan, oh. I really like the idea that I just want to be your best friend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I want nothing more than that. I'm going to work really hard to be your best friend. Um, but I do not know the real you Yeah, at all. Because I would probably be coming into the adventure with like the semblance of an, an alternate, uh, personality, I guess. Um, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if I'm on the run from, uh, from, you know, my home world or the, or, or organization or whatever the science people are of the, the, you know, um, but yeah, I, I can definitely I feel like whatever the story is there, like you're certainly not telling me the truth mm -hmm. about those things. And so like I, I can see us getting to a point where like I think that we're really great friends. Yeah. And something comes up where I see the real you and it's like devastating. Oh no. Because it's so it's so different. That's interesting. Right. Oh no. Oh um, like, I, how sad. Yeah. <laughs> I love I, a game of betrayal. <laughs> My favorite kind. Accidental betrayal. I'm sorry. <laughs> and this time it's you doing the backstabbing. Oh. I know, right? Uh oh. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's kind of fair. That's kind of what I designed my character for is uh, having kind of that double life or triple or quadruple life. <laughs> quadruple life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, for my, for my character, uh, for, uh, oh, I'm sorry. What did I say? Frongo? Frongo. Frongo. <laughs> um, so for Frongo, uh, because Olran, uh, typically, you know, their home world is pretty great. It's sort of at the center of Alexis, which is very safe, and they have a very structured society. So I feel like uh, for Frongo to be traveling out around Alexis, you know, looking for the way to make this perfect weapon, uh, it was probably somewhat of a bad break for Frongo to take off um, from Marthong, the home planet. 
of mm-hmm. the Ulran. Um, so I think maybe while I'm traveling Alexis looking for this perfect sword material, uh, maybe I hire my services out as a mercenary. I mean, mm. I, I clearly know a lot about weaponry. Uh, so, you know, and I have this military training background. So perhaps I was hired by one of you to help uh, maybe conceal an identity or if one of you has the ship and, you know, I'm I'm the local muscle, mm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I can definitely see Frango being involved in that capacity. I'm, I'm also kind of thinking, uh, since my character is on a, a journey to, uh, while while trying to hide, uh, they're, they're trying to find a solution to this burn. Mm. And I wonder if there's like uh, one of my my theories is uh, has something to do with this uh, material that you're seeking of mm-hmm. sorts or maybe like the origin of the material or or whatever, because um, I'm I'm kind of uh, theorizing that the burn uh, originated from within the galaxy mm. uh, f- instead of from without, since it surrounds oh. the entire galaxy. Mm, um so uh so all of the other scientists i'm guessing are focused on well how do we stop it from something that's causing it on the outside and i'm like no 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 it's it came from in the house mm-hmm. uh we have to, <gasps> we, have to- <laughs> <laughs> we could maybe stop it through the power of friendship yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. precious <laughs> uh, so think, how do we get a robot on our team then yeah i think i think i think alienware 17 uh had the ship i think mm-hmm. uh i am uh traveling around uh trying to find a way to make myself unique to make me feel like me physically i think maybe i ran into frongo uh oh, yeah. and maybe we're both you and looking I... for materials so maybe yeah. we decided and we'll take the yeah. split you organic me me metal well, it'll be great i think that's eventually where we got to and i think maybe at first i like tried to learn about weapons upgrades from you and we like worked on that and eventually mm-hmm. we were both vying for the same resources but also i was just like uh, no nah, this isn't this isn't right also i'm real tired of racing you to the you know treasure chest in every system yeah uh, so let's split let's oh uh, my god we were enemies up. that became friends oh, the yes. oh, I love yes. that. we were rivals yes. to friends <laughs> that was our story path before the story path that's right that's right that's right rivals <laughs> that's right oh that's amazing i can i can even see uh alienware 16 uh being the mm. the one that started the rivalry and then Ooh. something happened and 17 came back uh oh to to say you know, we can't we can't did keep I travel like this. did i travel to pax to pick you up 17 after you dramatically passed as 16 <gasps> did you <gasps> sacrifice yourself <gasps> oh my god and i drove our save, ship back to, to pick you up Flongo? oh my gosh are we in love i think we're in love <laughs> <laughs> All of this. I am so sorry. I just need a second because you said something about traveling to PAX and I got sad about not having conventions. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and like everything else in my brain turned off. Yes, we are oh. definitely in love. I definitely oh, yes. sacrificed myself for you. This is all great. I love it oh now that God. I'm back. So good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love this so much. Our crystal and our robot person. What a good, oh. good group of people except for me. Well, yeah, <laughs> there is always has to there, be one. That's exactly right. There is always one. I mean, okay, to be... And this time, dear listeners, it's not me. I know, this is so weird. <laughs> I'm I'm normally not the backstabber one, but... I know, you're normally I, the friendly one. I don't think my character is inherently a bad person. Of I course think, not. I think she is just... Um, <laughs> Like very they never focused, do. very focused on staying hidden. So even the closest of friends do not get to meet the real her, um, which is uh, just just kind of sad, I guess. She's very yeah. she's very sad uh, internally. Yeah, it's kind of lonely. But I think she's kind of bubbly on the outside. I mean, she's got a fun All name, right. so yeah. Well, then that's how you know. <laughs> Exactly. You have a fun name, then, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> this is very cool. We've got a really fun group here. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. We're ready to save Alexis. <laughs> save the entire well, galaxy. One sword at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. 
All right. Uh, well, in uh, in lieu of the amount of time that we have left, uh, let's get into our advancement discussion uh, and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. In this segment, we talk about character advancement and character growth. So we'll start. I kind of know the answer to this already because we've already touched on it a little bit. But how do characters grow and change as people within the narrative of the game? I mean, the game, like we've mentioned before, the game is about uh, discovery and choices. The galaxy is ending, n- not in the next five minutes, but also not in a million years. Uh, and so what do you do with that? And I think with every mission, adventure, quest, whatever that you go on, I think your characters learn what they do with that. You know, uh, we're ugh, Spoilers a little bit, I guess, for the adventure that comes with Burn Bright for Burning Daylight. Um, you know, we uh, our team on the stream game just just recently reached uh, a place where we are trying to save some hostages. I will make this as vague as possible. Uh, and uh, and there is nothing about the situation that we are in that we would should suggest that we should stay there. Um, We should have left a long time ago and sorry, hostages. Uh, (laughs) But what's interesting is that, uh, and I I can only speak for my character. I'm not going to speak for the other three, but for me, like there was a moment, and I think I said it out loud, actually, there was a moment where I uh, was like, we should go, (laughs) but we have to save these hostages because because that's what we were sent here to do because that's what's right because we have decided that we are on the side of uh, like humanity is a weird word to use since there are no humans but you know what i mean um yeah and so atash discovered that they in fact will put random stranger safety in front of their own uh in in situations like this you know it's no longer an abstract thing and i think you know, in in the alternate universe where we finish up this mission and these four characters continue to adventure through space, uh, I think that would very much sort of inform how Atash looks at uh, future missions and and what sorts of things they're going to want to take on and what sorts of things they're willing to do. Uh, you know, when the world is ending, every decision you make counts and mm-hmm. and forces you to really sort of have a look at yourself and figure out what it is that you're willing to do and what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, so I think that sort yeah, of, sorry, go ahead. So there's a very interesting clock on character growth in this game. Without like, unlike being... something like D and D where you're like, I'm going to adventure till I die. Exactly. Like... And there's a clock without there being, you know, a ticking time bomb mm-hmm. that's going to end at the end of this right. session. Right. Because yeah. that can right. sort of rush you to things that feel artificial. Right. It's just the totally. fact that, you know, that the universe is finite in a very real way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think I remember um, one of the examples of one of the adventures you can go on is like salvage missions right at the edge of the burn. Uh, that would be the most intense thing I can think of. Uh, to go in there knowing if you don't get out, if you don't allot time to get out, you ain't getting out uh, because that burn's coming. And if you're right at the edge, that's going to that's gonna be very bad news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I mean, speaking of that, you know, that interesting idea of advancement um, because you did bring up, you know, in in Dungeons and Dragons, it is sort of always the assumption like, oh, we're going to play this campaign. I'm going to play this character until our group falls apart. Mm. You know, whether that's like, you know, three weeks or a year, that's like sort of what it feels like. But uh, in this game with level advancement, um, you know, the, the only growth feature they have in this game is these story paths. Mm. So it's it's really interesting to look at like, okay, how what is this journey as I go over this arc of a story path? Because, you know, it is recommended for every two hours of play, one character in your party will achieve a story path moment. Mm. So say if you're saying with, you know, you're playing with three players, uh, oh, I got lost on the math here, but that's <laughs> three, nine, twelve, 12, 12 games face. where you're, <laughs> wow. Um, so there is like a, you know, a, 
it will be happening. These these players will be hitting these story path events, uh, which is sort of like because they have to have these moments of growth usually to to get this next echelon. So your characters are constantly on this track of growing and changing. It's mm-hmm. you know not negotiable. Uh, for your characters, which is which is very interesting because I feel like, you know, in other games, you can be the same person forever and ever and ever if you are resistant to story and change. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this game, you can't if you want to grow as a character, which is a really interesting narrative way of framing it. Um, I also, you know, am, am really interested to see what a game looks like where all of the characters hit a story path. And then you all choose another story path, you know, for that next advancement. Like, how does that work? How do those story paths build or interplay? Because it feels like, you know, so much of our lives, we're like, oh, this is my mission in life. That's why it's my story path. Then it's like, what happens when you achieve that? What happens when you make the perfect weapon? You know, what happens when you successfully pull off your double life? Mm-hmm. What's the next step, I think, is is a really interesting part of leveling in this game. Can you can you have multiple story paths at the same time, or is it just uh, go on one until it's done, or until you swap to another one? Right. So until you swap to, I, I believe you can choose to abandon a story path and pick up another one. Okay. Um, otherwise, you do have to play a story path to its completion if you want to start another one after that. So that's really interesting. Yeah. So it's, it it, it kind of has like a built in ambition to yeah. it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, like, if your ambition changes then you you have to go to a new story path. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. So can so I how ask does what the, it's oh, oh, go, oh ahead, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say can I ask what that's like as somebody running the game to have these like different story paths that people are on because like as a person playing this character it's like I want my things to come up and obviously as a player I'm going to try and make decisions that lead me toward those mm-hmm. hitting those story beats. Yeah. But like as a GM, like how does that work trying to make everybody's work together and to like incorporate those things into a session? Yeah, it has definitely been a challenge uh, to that is a unique challenge to to those, you know, preparing to run uh, Burn Bright, because also, you know, for this campaign, I was given a module. Right. And Mm -hmm. say, okay, you have to play through this module. And then it's like, okay, but then in character creation, everybody picked these story paths. Mm -hmm. So, and I have to satisfy these story path moments. So finding cohesion between the module I was given and the story path has created some interesting challenges, but also some interesting scenes and encounters that never would have happened had it not been for the story path. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think, you know, the module I was given, I was like, okay, this would take us about five episodes to play through, like five two hour sessions. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask for 10 episodes so that that way we can build in enough time to explore those moments and to, you know, hit the main beats of the story while also hitting the beats of everybody else's path. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, one of my characters picked up the the mystery path. So I built a mystery into their ship and the identity of the ship. And of course, that's not part of the module, mm-hmm. uh, but it's something, you know, they are dealing with this strange presence or these oddities on a ship while also trying to save the galaxy mm. in this module. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, it's definitely a, a weaving process in this game, but uh, something I think makes uh, this game u- unique and, and special. Mm-hmm. I have to brag on Celeste just a little bit. She's done such an amazing job of doing that weaving that I can I can specifically think of when each of my fellow players achieved their first story point. And for all three of them, it wasn't until they said, yeah, I hit this story point and here's what it was that I realized that it was a woven in outside of the of the module thing. Ow. <laughs> Truly, the mystery one of our other players is uh, to tame a beast, and mm-hmm. and and that's where the blip came from that Atash accidentally turned into. That's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, and the third one is to is to gain a following, uh, and all three of those. And I'm only not speaking about mine uh, because. I knew what mine was, obviously, Mm -hmm. so I couldn't be so surprised by it. Uh, (laughs) But those other three were so beautifully woven in and have made the story so much richer. You know, it's it's definitely uh, in a thought experiment of running this sort of thing and watching what Celeste has done. It is definitely something that um, 
is a different approach than say reading a published adventure and running what's in there and like allowing your players to sort of be creative and make their own story because of their individual in the moment choices. Uh, and it's so very exciting this way uh, to have these other threads sort of woven in that, you know, we're going to be completely your own groups and and how they can or how they do or or maybe don't tie into the adventure that you're running. You mm-hmm. know, the the beast that our other uh, that our other character that our other player has begun to befriend saved her in the middle of a very intense battle in this place that we absolutely should not be. So you know, her story <laughs> path has woven into the story. Um, yeah, it's 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 really, really interesting. Hmm. I, I can see it being interesting to to do character creation uh, and leaving out what story path you choose uh, when you're doing it all together, because then that that will add to the nice uh, surprise tidbits uh, when you get to that later. I think that's pretty cool. So uh, mechanically then, how does this all work? So there are uh, each story path has five specific sort of uh, levels to it, uh, and it tells you uh, what it is that you have to achieve or accomplish or have happened to you in some cases uh, in order to tick off that particular story beat for yourself. Um, for the most part, they go in order. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, many of them, the middle three are sort of. They happen in whatever order the narrative takes you, but there's definitely a beginning and an end to each story path. And so at the end of a given session, uh, you check in the GM and the players check in. And do you think you have accomplished one of the things on your story path list? Uh, And if you have and if everyone agrees that you have, uh, then you get uh, a bonus. You get a level up, you get to advance, right? Uh, And that pretty much, with a few minor exceptions, pretty much always mean either you are increasing a single die size or you are gaining a new special ability or Nova ability. Hmm. Um, Which means that advancement is pretty slow and fairly minor. I mean, some of those special abilities and Nova abilities can be a lot. Yeah. Uh, but those at the very most, you're really you're really only getting a max of two abilities in your story path. The rest of them are just die increases. Oh, okay. uh, so advancement is advancement is slow. And mm-hmm. if you are used to, you know, uh, I'm going to use D&D as an example. If you're used to the power jumps uh, per level and then having those uh, like fifth level and 11th level where the power really jumps and it's a whole different tier of play. Right. That's not really a burn bright thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even if let's say even if you get a story path thing every single session for five sessions, I I mean, that's what three dice increase that you you know may or may not use in a given session and a couple of new special abilities. That's that's a that's a slower system than than many people may be used to. Mm -hmm. And I think and I think that's fine. I think that reinforces that it isn't about what you can do. It's about what you choose to do and how you do it and how you work Mm -hmm. with the rest of your team to do it. Yeah. Uh, it really, yeah, that kind of riffing off of that, it really is a game about learning how to live in your character, you know, day to day, uh, which which I love. I It just feels like such a unique challenge um, and experience that has made it just really nice um, because it really does feel satisfying, even though you aren't, you know, accumulating all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it feels very satisfying to keep playing this game. Um, I also do like that it, it gives a greater weight to things like equipment uh, in this universe and like money actually means something because now, you know, you can use money to buy items that work with your abilities or enhance the abilities you already have. Mm -hmm. So instead of like, you know, putting all the focus on these random powers that you get as you get (laughs) levels, um, you know, you have to earn these awesome pieces of equipment and, you know, these upgrades for your ship. Uh, and then, you know, that way, you know, you do good and then you can buy good stuff and you can continue to do good mm-hmm. uh, and buy more stuff. Uh, so I actually really I really enjoy how simple that mechanic is for leveling. And mm-hmm. it is definitely unlike a lot of other systems out there. So really cool to experience. Uh, it, it's 
part of it is tickling the min max portion of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> um and like part of me wants to go through and scour through all the rules and see what's the optimal uh story path like abandon <laughs> this path go to this path and what can i upgrade to get to the best sats and and uh yeah i'm i'm definitely from the 90s uh for role playing <laughs> that's for sure but yeah this it's it's really interesting that you can you can just go through hey i hit this beat this is what i get Let's do it. It seems pretty yeah. fast. Yeah, mm-hmm. I also really, really like that uh, in the you know story path section of the rules, they say that before you start every single game, you should go around and review what your story paths are and what your next event is. Um, so as a group, before you start playing, uh, it recommends in the rules that you do that. And then it also recommends at the very end of every session, you know, you end the game and before you all go away, you look once again at, okay, what is my path? What is my goal mm-hmm. to help remind both, you know, your party about what, what you're trying to accomplish and then also your game master. Um, so mm-hmm. I really like that as sort of like a warm up and cool down, mm-hmm. you know, um, for, for any game. It feels like a really cool way to, to focus on each character and just to remind everybody, you know, yeah. where we're at in the story and where we are in our personal growth. And and it also uh, kind of leaves uh, a space open for some safety tool uh, work there as well. So mm-hmm. if oh, any yeah. if any lines or veils are needed at the start, toss you have them in. this little built in warm up yeah. time to talk and about your your stories and your paths exactly. and your expectations. It's yeah. really great. And then yeah. at the end of the game, if uh, if you needed to decompress because of an extra intense session, uh, you've got that time set aside. I think that's really cool that uh, this story path thing that bookends your session really kind of naturally weaves itself into that sort of uh, talk, which is cool. Yeah, definitely. Well, and that's a conversation I like to have at the end of sessions of games anyway, too, is like, okay, here's what we did this time. Quick recap. Also, like, here's what I'd love to see next time. Here's what I like. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing that I'm, you know, like of the 10 things that came up in this game. Here's the one or two that I'm like super interested in. Mm -hmm. And like, I like to kind of let my GM know, like, here's, you know, here's the thread that I would like to pull on. Um, And so I think talking through the story pass gives you the opportunity to do that too. Mm-hmm. It's just built in. Yeah. It reminds me of, yeah, it, there's a aftercare kind of uh, session procedure out there called stars and wishes, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. is, you know, where you talk about the things you love the session and yeah. then, you know, the, the things you wish uh, were in the game or what you want to see next time. Um, so it feels mm-hmm. like that mechanic is built in, which is mm-hmm. just super fun. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So is there anything else that we want to cover before we wrap things up? I mean, I just want to say, uh, really, this uh, playing Burn Bright has kind of opened my eyes up to a genre that I didn't anticipate falling in love with. Mm -hmm. Um, But once I started exploring what science fantasy is as a genre and how it plays in role playing games, uh, I just... I love it so much, and I feel that <laughs> it has influenced my my design and my creativity uh, playing this game and kind of breaking outside of my box to try something new. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just done me a world of good. So I can't recommend enough uh, to people if you are, you know, on the edge of picking up this game. Absolutely do it. Just find a group. Uh, It's super easy to make characters, as you've seen. Uh, So, you know, it's not a big time sink just to try a game out, Mm -hmm. you know, with Mm -hmm. a group of friends. So just try it. And I I think you'll enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, I I know I certainly have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it took the words right out of my mouth. You know, it's uh, science fantasy, science fiction. I think I mentioned this last time, you know, not something that that immediately grabbed my attention, but I love what this system is. I love what the lore of this setting is. Um, and, and I, I can't wait to see what other people create Mm -hmm. with this system. You know, there's already at least one other stream out there that stream series out there that's using the system. I can't wait to get to go back and watch some of their stuff, see what people come up with, you know, what, 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 third party publishers no that's not a thing but uh see you know see what everyone else can come up with as a thing 
it's also, you know, how often do you get to to hop in at literally the beginning of a new new (laughs) RPG system, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't wait to see what what additional content Roll20 and the designers come out with. But like right now, how exciting that you can jump in and know exactly as much as everyone else. There is no pressure in any way to know any more or any less than you do coming in. Uh, Mm -hmm. Pressure (laughs) real or imagined, usually imagined. But that's a whole other conversation. Uh, Yeah, I just think it's super exciting and it's new and it's recent and grab it now get in on it Mm -hmm. well celeste eugenio thank you so much for joining us to talk about burn bright can you remind everybody where they can find you online what sort of things you're working on yeah, uh, so you, the best way to find out everything I'm doing up, up and coming uh, is to follow me on Twitter at C. Conowich. Uh, if you want to check out the all of the streams that I do, all of the podcasts I do, what I am publishing, uh, you can always check out my website, CelesteConowich.com. And for those of you who are listening, uh, modern-ish, uh, September 1st, 2020, um, uh, I just recently released uh, my first solo title on the DMs Guild yeah. uh, for an adventure. It's called Dino World. <laughs> so uh, it's definitely not a ripoff of Jurassic Park. So uh, if you <laughs> don't love dinosaurs, so no. If you love dinosaurs, if you love Jurassic Park, you should pick up a copy of my adventure Dino World. <laughs> um, I'm super proud of it. It's a lot of pulp action fun. Mm. Uh, so check that out. And of course, uh, check out the Venture Maidens podcast if you run out of character creation episodes uh, to listen <laughs> to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at, at DM Jazzy Hands. That's also probably the the best and easiest place to get info on what I'm up to. Uh, you can follow the podcast at DND Last Refuge. Uh, that's sort of my baby and what got me started into content creation and has been going the longest. So uh, if you get done with with character creation and Venture Maidens, we have a fair number of, <laughs> of episodes that you can get through. Um and uh, yeah, and then my website has has links to the stuff that I have published on the DMs Guild, either as a designer or an editor. Um, it has links to I also do some video game streaming on my Twitch channel. You can find me there. Uh, and anytime a new stream series or anything like that gets announced, uh, I'll announce it on Twitter and then add it to my website as soon as possible. So EugeniaVargas.com. Also a good place. Plus, you can see all these super cute pictures of me doing musical theater because that's my actual career. Uh, I have not. Well, actually, lately, I sort of seem to have made the leap into free full time freelancer, but not so much by choice. Uh, usually I by trade am an actor and a music director. So uh, my website also has cute shots of that stuff. Mm hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for sitting down to do this with us. Uh, and thank you to everyone tuning in. We'll see you thank next time. You. And that's a wrap for Series 32, everyone. Uh, we are so glad you could join us for the series. If you enjoyed what you heard, you can head on over to Roll20 and get a copy of the game for yourself. Don't forget to check out the Thirsty Sword Lesbians and Unbound Kickstarters. Both of them are super fantastic games. We'll put links to them in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Find them there. Absolutely. Also, I would love to see some of you all join me every other Friday on my live stream of my Chimera game uh, that we are titling A Tale of Twinkle and Awe, uh, where we are blending fantasy, superhero, and magical girl genres together. Uh, So far, we came up with a solar punk world with holographic magic technology, uh, including hover public transportation and even hover shoes. Nice. Um, Oh, and there's a sentient parrot elected official that we've named behind the scenes to be named on stream. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, It's it's really, really very good. Uh, But you can find us every other Friday at 730 p.m. Central at twitch.chimera.games. Speaking of sentient parent parent elected officials. Yeah. How about your human elected officials? (laughs) Just a reminder to everybody, there's early voting in a lot of places happening right now. You can check your state laws and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think myvote.gov is the place to go. But please either 
request your absentee ballot, find a place to do early voting, make a plan to go on election day to go vote, please absolutely 100% exercise your right to vote. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, this really is mostly for our American listeners. If you live other places, also vote. Uh, but, you know, whenever that happens for you. But honestly, I cannot emphasize strongly enough how important this election is for so many, many, many people. Mm-hmm. Please go vote. Please exercise your democratic rights before they take them away from us. <laughs> And and that's go not do it. Yeah. Like I, I mean, and honestly, like I don't mean that as a joke. Please, before they strip so many of us of our rights, mm-hmm. go use them. Absolutely. Aside from all of that, it is one of our favorite times. It's review time. Ooh. This is our last review. We said that last time, and someone sent just one. Thank you. So thank you so much, there. Thank you, Scott Cass from the United States of America on iTunes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but please, please send us reviews. We need them. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we need them so much. <laughs> this one from Scott Cass is titled Love the Show. Really enjoy the show. And the conceit is brilliant and randomly creating characters for systems I may never play is something I do on my own spare time, too. The hosts are both extremely enthusiastic, which helps carry through some of the duller systems. Hope to see you guys do Burning Wheel sometime soon. Very Thank cool. you very much. It is on our list. We yeah, have, absolutely. We have an ever-growing list, ever and constantly growing list of games. But mm-hmm. yeah, thank you so much. That was a very nice review, and we're glad you're enjoying it. Even the boring systems, even <laughs> Heroes Unlimited. Thank you for sticking with us. <laughs> all right, and with all of that out of the way, we'll see you in a week, two weeks? Three weeks? Three Somewhere weeks? around there. I don't know. D- time yeah, time doesn't mean anything anymore. I don't anymore. know, you guys. I don't know. <laughs> Just go we'll vote. We'll see you soon. Go vote. <laughs> Honestly, you've got plenty of time. You have at least two weeks because I'm not looking at a calendar. Go vote. Okay? Mm-hmm. Don't come back until you vote. <laughs> there will be no new episode for you until you have voted. Just kidding. I think one comes out the day before the election day. Before. day. <laughs> the day before. You know what? Maybe we'll hold off and you won't get it till Wednesday <laughs> until you prove to me that you've voted. I don't think either of us can handle that, Amelia. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, everyone. Until next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we got to read some show blurbs. 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 Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows, 
like Neo Scum. Neo Scum is a narrative comedy podcast featuring five Chicago improvisers antagonizing their way through the role playing classic Shadowrun. It follows a group of misfits and outsiders Z, the acerbic cyber troublemaker, Pox, the candy junkie klepto from across the pond, Tech Wizard, the public access actor with a petulant thirst for adventure, and Dak Rambo, the nastiest trucker this side of the Robo Mason Dixon. Join the irascible Neo Scum crew on a puerile rockin' road trip through a weirdo world of tomorrow, doling out street justice to every deeb they encounter, whether they deserve it or not. E. I did it. Yeah. I got waveforms. Like a professional. Now I have uh, too many waveforms because my kids are running above my head. Oh, nice. nice. Oh, good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I found out I've got RX uh, for some audio cleanup stuff. And uh, I can just select the very low, like 50 and under bass frequency Mm -hmm. and delete it. Gets rid of all my kids plotting. (laughs) That's <laughs> like instantaneously. That's Very remarkable. Nice. This is why we record when my kids aren't home, so mm-hmm. that because <laughs> I don't think that I could. Uh, they're very loud. Yeah. Aside from your dad opening the garage door and oh yeah, the, the dog barking and the lawn mowing and the yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not like the good. adults at home are quiet. Yeah. Right now, <laughs> both my computer and my refrigerator are having a very hard time with how hot it is, so that's oh, going to be no. fun background noise. At um, least background noise that's consistent. Yeah, noise this. reduction, it'll be That's fun. right, yeah. that's right. The Just magic of editing. Of mm-hmm. All right, so any <clears throat> questions before we start? Uh... Oh, no, just quick question. Well, I, I, yes, yes. Um, yes. And, and so um, for me, make- is your roll 20 still loading or is it jammed <clears throat> on my end? It says burn bright, burning daylight. And it's, can you, can you see me scrolling around? Uh, no, we no. just have a big white line. Maybe we're on the wrong screen. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. It kind of looks screen. like Pong. Is about it to does start. a little bit look Pong. like a large Pong screen, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and as does. fun as that would be. Uh, as fun as, yeah, as fun as that Welcome is. Welcome to okay. Character Creation Cast. Today we're talking about char- creating characters for Pong. <laughs> for Pong, Pong. Um, yes. I just like to get really deep into it. Okay, so now I need to remember how to invite you to the campaign. Go uh, to yeah, exit, so exit game. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you were so close. <laughs> Is it, is it in here somewhere? It's in it's in the settings tab that you were... I'm pointing at the screen like you can see where I'm pointing. Yeah, I know. I'm, doing it too. I'm pointing with my it's mouse, right and it's like, it's so dumb. Go home. I love it. Go home. Okay. Click on C3. Yep, right there. Ooh. And then invite players on the right. Ooh. I'm probably and just probably giving easier us the just link. Copy, yeah. yeah, just copy that link into the Zoom chat. Look at that link. Look I can um, figure out how to get to the Zoom chat. Um, more chat. Ooh, hello oh, everyone. My cheers. There we go. For you. Very cool. Fantastic. Sweet. I was wondering what this attributes what and I... abilities tab was for, and I never really cared to ask about it because it seemed too advanced for me. <laughs> it's if you really want to go in and like mess with <laughs> program the program it yourself. And, yeah. 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 I figured. I there was part of me a while ago. That wanted to recreate the Palladium character sheets mm. uh, in Roll20. And I said, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah, there are times where I'm like, learning a game is really hard. Learning to do a game other places is really, really hard. And uh, it depends on, you know, whether I've medicated for the ADHD or not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's very fair. <laughs> All right. Um... Now I have to find my episode notes. Um, I think do 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 do. You start. Uh, just making sure. <laughs> you start. I that part. <laughs> well, I'm just like, you know, like sometimes you're like looking around to figure out if it's on me or if it's on you, and it's on you today, sir. I know. I just wanted to alter this question. Okay. Cool. So now that I'm ready. 
Uh, is everybody else ready? I'm sure yes. the answer is probably yeah. Give yes. me one second, because <laughs> my there's a train passing very slowly above my apartment, and it's not oh. actually usually. So this happens all the time when I'm recording my show, and I usually just stop. <laughs> But usually they just pass by, it's super loud, and then it's done. Right now this train is going very slowly, and so the noise of the train is not getting picked up, but it's vibrating my apartment, so my oh, no. mic boom is vibrating, which is causing, yeah. like, weird... So give me one second for it to finish passing. Oh. Yeah, I'm just gonna, just... like, take off my earrings, too, because they're, like, clicking on my headphones. Oh, no. That's why I never wear earrings. I do have ice cubes. Um, I will do my best <laughs> to, to not... <laughs> It's so hot. I can't. <laughs> I don't mind, I don't I don't mind the off. clicking. Yeah. Just just don't mm-hmm. shake your ice cubes around while mm-hmm. you're talking. And it'll pull be a okay. Virginia Wolf. Oh. Yep. <laughs> 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 okay. I think we're mostly good over here. Okay. Awesome. They swarm together and create collective consciences. Con- conscien- consciences. Consciousnesses. Oh, y'all. Uh, <laughs> create collective <laughs> consciousnesses, which you is what it. you play. So that's going to be super fun to edit later. <laughs> <laughs> we just kept talking. Yeah. I think, Amelia, you are muted. There we go. The dog was barking. Um. <laughs> what was I going to say? Uh... I don't remember. <laughs> well, very cool. Um, I have to find. Whoa, it beeped at me. My outline. There we go. Oh, that was the chat. We have so much money. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> not really, but that's fine. <laughs> Ship modules are expensive, so nah, not really. <laughs> we'll say we do. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to stop my recording. Stop the recording. I did it. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah. 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 Take that waveform. Uh, That's right. Yes, and I will tell you that as soon as this train stops passing over my apartment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Stop. Yeah. Uh, stop. Is that a stop? All right. That's a stop.